Hey everybody, coming live at you today, the last day of 2020. Can you believe we're there already on New Year's Eve? And uh, today, I'm going to start, I think, referring to this as the studio now that I got the mic. And yeah, I think we're going to say that. <laughs> but uh, we're going to be diving in Leviticus chapter 6 today. And as we dive into this chapter, we see uh, restitution part 2 and procedures about the offerings part one and that's because in uh, in this chapter we're going to see this continuing concept of paying a fine of adding that 20 percent when you've transgressed when you've broken the law and and then we're also going to see the beginning of a bunch of procedures about offerings we largely have already looked at um, but the, these things are kind of uh, together here in this particular chapter and again, by way of reminder, in the original text, there were no chapters and verse numbers. We've added those so we can read along, study together. But if you found Exodus, uh, Leviticus chapter 6 this morning, I'd like to invite you to read through that with me. We're going to read through uh, different sections and discuss it verse by verse. So, here we go, starting in verse 1. It says this, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, if a person sins and commits a trespass against the Lord by lying to his neighbor about what was delivered to him for safekeeping about a pledge or about robbery, or if he has extorted from his neighbor, or if he has found what was lost and lies concerning it and swears falsely in any of these things that a man may do in which he sins, then it shall be, because he has sinned and is guilty, that he shall restore what he has stolen, or the thing which he has extorted, or what was delivered to him for safekeeping, or the thing which he has found, or all that about which he has sworn falsely. He shall restore its full value, add one-fifth to it, and give it to whomever it belongs. Get this on the last part of verse 5 on the same day of his trespass offering. We see here in the law that when someone lied, and it covers a lot of different ways in which lying can take place, extorting, lying about something you found, lying about something you're entrusted to care for, many different ways in which lying can take place. And under the law, they were to not only restore its full value, but to add a fifth to it, to add that fine, if you will, that penalty of 20%. And notice in the last part of verse 5, not only did they give the full value and the fine of 20% to whomever it belonged, but on the same day as they brought their offering. I'm reminded in the Gospels when Jesus speaks about how when you are making your offering to the Lord, and remember that your brother has something against you. Go and be made right with your brother, and then come and make your offering. I'm reminded of Jesus saying that. The principle, I think, is shown very clearly here, back in Leviticus. We go on in verse 6, and we read this, And he shall bring his trespass offering to the Lord, a ram without blemish of the flock, with your valuation as a trespass offering, to the priest. So you've got to go to the priest in order to have the mediation, to have your sin atoned for. We go to the priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 7, So the priest shall make atonement for him before the Lord, and he shall be forgiven for any one of these things that he may have done in which he trespassed. Now this word trespass carries with it the idea of transgression. And we dove into this some yesterday, but I want to remind us that this word trespass means to transgress, to break the law. If you trespass on somebody's property, you step over into where you're not allowed to be. So this is breaking of something that is a law. But when they offered their offering for it, I'm reminded of the beauty of the gospel today. Under the Old Covenant back here in Leviticus, they had to go and they had to follow all of these procedures, specific offerings, specific fines, going to the priest. The book of Hebrews reminds us that we have the New Covenant, the better covenant, the covenant foreshadowed here. All these things were done 
ultimately pointing to the coming of the Messiah, the, the second Moses as he was known, and the new high priest of a better and new covenant, the fulfilled covenant, which came in the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I'm reminded of 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9 that we don't have to go and to do all these things, all these procedures in order to, to find reconciliation and restoration. No, we just have to go to the Lord. We confess our sin, and He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. These laws here were not about salvation, they were about reconciliation. Now Jesus does not say that we just get a free pass on the reconciliation aspect. The Gospels speak a lot about the reconciliation aspect. Not just being vertically right with God, but horizontally being right with one another as well. We go on in verse 8, and we see now some procedures about laws that we've already looked at. So if you look with me here in verse 8, it starts with the burnt offering. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command Aaron and his sons, saying, This is the law of burnt offering. The burnt offering shall be on the hearth, upon the altar, all night until morning, and the fire of the altar shall be kept burning on it, and the priest shall shall put on his linen garment and his linen trousers. He shall put on his body, and he shall take up the ashes of the burnt offering, which the fire has consumed on the altar, and he shall put them beside the altar. Then he shall take off his garments, put on other garments, and carry the ashes outside the camp to a clean place. Verse 12, And fire on the altar shall be kept burning on it, it shall not be put out, and the priest shall burn wood on it every morning. And lay the burnt offering in order on it, and he shall burn on it the fat of the peace offerings. Verse 13, a fire shall always be burning on the altar, it shall never go out. I think there's a, a, an application and a, a theological connection to why on the burnt offering altar the fire was never to go out on that altar. Why? Because it was on the altar that sin was atoned for. Specifically the burnt offering, you can go back and you can look at it. There always is the atonement aspect, even when you're bringing thankfulness in these offerings to the Lord. If you've been wrong in some way, the atonement of the Lord's covering blood. So today, this is what we see. And we see all the things in regard to the burnt offering they had to do. That fire always been kept burning, meaning you could always come before the Lord. How true is that of the Lord Jesus Christ today? That He is always ready and able. We can boldly come before His throne of grace and find mercy and help, the Bible says, in our time of need. Jesus is available whenever we need him. Praise God for that. We see specifically that there are also procedures that had to be taken care of in order to exercise the burnt offering. The priest had to deal with the ashes that would be produced from making these offerings, completely burning them up. It produced waste. It produced the ashes. And the priest had to literally change their clothes. They had to take off their holy special garments that were for ministry in the temple, uh, in the tabernacle in this case, the, the movable temple, if you will. And then they had to carry the ashes outside the camp to a clean place. Many, many procedures had to go into dealing with the residue that even came from the offering. Aren't you thankful that Jesus has dealt with everything once for all by his blood? I know I'm thankful for that. We go on to verse 14 and we see uh, the law of the grain offering, procedures about making a grain offering. It says this, This is the law of the grain offering. The sons of Aaron shall offer it on the altar before the Lord. He shall take from it his handful of fine flour of the grain offering with its oil and all the frankincense which is on the grain offering and shall burn it on the altar for a sweet aroma as a memorial to the Lord. Verse 16, And the remainder of it Aaron and his sons shall eat 
with unleavened bread. It shall be eaten in a holy place. In the court of the tabernacle of meeting they shall eat it. It shall not be baked with leaven. I have given it as their portion of my offerings made by fire. It is most holy like the sin offering and the trespass offering. Verse 18. All the males among the children of Aaron may eat it. It shall be a statute forever in your generations concerning the offerings made by fire to the Lord. Everyone who touches them must be holy. In the grain offering, which was the staff of life, if you will, grain, reminding me of the bread of life that Jesus Christ reveals himself as in John chapter 6. The grain offering was a special offering in which a handful, a memorial portion, was taken and burned to the Lord, but the rest of it became sustenance and provision for the priests who were doing this work. God provided for them even in the midst of the dirty and diligent and yucky work that they had to do in, in making atonement for people's sins and even in receiving the offerings of praise and thankfulness. Even that was not always a clean and happy process. But the priests did that. The Lord provided for them through it. It even says specifically in verse 17 that the Lord had given as their portion of his offerings to them. We then go on to verse 19. And we see more about the offerings here. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, This is the offering of Aaron and his sons, which they shall offer to the Lord, beginning on each day when he is anointed. So this was an offering the priests had to make. We've seen a lot of offerings the other people make. Here's an offering the priests had to make. On the day that they're anointed, one-tenth of an ephah of fine flour as a daily grain offering, half of it in the morning and half of it at night. It shall be made in the pan with oil, when it is mixed, you shall bring it in. The baked pieces of the grain offering you shall offer for a sweet aroma to the Lord. The priest from among his sons who is anointed in his place shall offer it. It is a statute forever to the Lord. It shall be wholly burned for every grain offering for which the priest shall be wholly burned. It shall not be eaten. When the priest made an offering here, they weren't allowed to eat of it. They were making this to the Lord. So they didn't get any type of kickback, even though they kind of, if you will, got that kickback sometimes for certain ones of the offerings that the people would make. But every day, as part of the anointing, when they were anointed, they would make this offering in the morning and in the evening. And it had to be wholly burned to the Lord as a sweet aroma to Him. They themselves worshipped the Lord. They thanked Him. They praised Him. And the priests weren't sinless. They needed atonement. The praise be to God that the Lord Jesus Christ is a perfect high priest that does not have to make any offering of sin for himself. He's made offering for us, and it was sufficient for one time to be the final sacrifice. We go on to verse 24, and we wrap up learning something very important about the sacrifices. Also the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and to his sons, saying, This is the law of the sin offering. In the place where the burnt offering is killed, the sin offering shall be killed before the Lord. It is most holy. The priest who offers it for sin shall eat it. In a holy place it shall be eaten in the courts of the tabernacle of meeting. Everyone who touches its flesh must be holy. And when its blood is sprinkled on any garment, you shall wash that on which it was sprinkled in a holy place. But the earthen vessel in which it was boiled shall be broken. And if it is boiled in a bronze pot, it shall be both scoured and rinsed in water. All the males among the priests may eat it. It shall be most holy, but no sin offering from which any of the blood is brought into the tabernacle of meeting to make atonement in the holy place shall be eaten. It shall be burned in the fire. When the offerings were made, if it was brought into the tent, into the, tent, into the holy place, it was not allowed to be eaten of. It was to wholly to be burned to the Lord. There was something about atonement being made in the courtyard where the burnt offerings were made and where the bronze altar was. 
but for things that were brought into the tabernacle. They were not allowed to be eaten. We also see something very interesting in verse 28, where it talks about how any earthen vessel in which these offerings have been boiled must be broken. They must be destroyed. And we also see that if they use a bronze pot in which to cook these things, that the bronze pot must be scoured and rinsed in water. I'm reminded, and this is not the interpretation, I don't believe, of the passage, but I'm reminded of an application of this in my own life. And in connection with the New Testament teaching that uses some similar language. I'm thankful that God uses cracked pots. I'm thankful that he uses us broken and contrite. I'm thankful that he uses broken vessels for his glory. And while we may be broken and weak and like Paul, we cry out, Lord, take this away. The Lord tells us that his grace is sufficient and his power is made perfect in weakness. I'm reminded of the need to endure. I'm reminded that the Lord allows us to suffer and the Lord allows us to go through things for the sake of making us more like Jesus Christ. Have you ever been through a scouring time in your life where you're being rubbed and rubbed? I mean, scouring hot water, an itchy, scratchy implement in order to scour that pan, scour that pot in which was used. I've had to wash dishes before and scouring is no fun. But when you're the... When you're the cookware that's being scoured upon, you know that that's not fun. It finishes all up with the glorious rinsing of the water and the washing away of all the filth has finally been scraped off. And then you're clean. All these offerings had a purpose. There are things we can observe about how they did this, where they did this and made these offerings. But I'm reminded of the application at the very end. The broken pots. The scoured vessels. Finally, the rinsing in clean water. And the reminder that nothing that was made for a sin offering and the blood brought in the tabernacle, they couldn't eat of it. It was not a praise offering. It was not a thankful offering. It was atonement for sin that was being made. That's what made it distinct. Would you join me in prayer today as we wrap up this passage and wrap up this chapter? And next time when we meet together, it's going to be a new year. I pray it's a new year of new beginnings for you. I pray it's also a year that may perhaps mirror something I just read today. I was reading a devotional by F.B. Meyer, a preacher from a long time ago. And he made the statement talking about Lot leaving Abraham when Lot saw the beautiful land of the Jordan River and all the bounty it offered, and he went to it. He chose that portion for himself, but it was also filled with a lot of temptation and sin. I'm reminded that when Lot left Abraham for that area, that separation ended up being a blessing in Abraham's life. Perhaps this year, you can look back and reflect on some things the Lord has separated from your life for His glory, but also for your good. He has taken away some things in order so that you can be separated more unto Him. More singleness of focus, barriers, perhaps temptations, perhaps some relationships this past year have ended, and maybe it's not been a bad thing, but it's been for God's glory and for your growth. And ultimately also, not only for his glory, but for your good, that you will be growing more Christ-like as a result of those things being stripped from your life. Would you join me in prayer today? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this year of 2020 in which you have been with us. Father, and I know there will be others watching this at times that don't have anything to do with this year, perhaps far, far into the future replaying the recording of this. But Father, I pray that wherever they find themselves today, that they can be reminded of those closing words. That Lord, you can separate things from us. Father, we learn a lot of things from the passage 
be read today about restitution. Clearly, I think some applications there to our own lives that the Holy Spirit can guide us in. Also, Father, we see many details about how the priests had to do things and so many theological connections to how Jesus was the best and final sacrifice. And just how much more that makes me thankful for him. That I don't have to go through all of these procedures and things as a constant reminder of my sin. I get to go to him and be reconciled right away. Lord Jesus, thank you that you were the final sacrifice for us. Thank you that you were sufficient and you were available when we need you. Thank you that you love us and are merciful to us when we are unlovable and when we are unmerciful. Thank you, Father, for that. We give you the praise, the honor, and the glory for all your many blessings this year. And Lord, for what you yet have in store in the future. And we just pray that you would continue to lead and to guide us. Father, that our hearts would be open to what you had to teach us in a new year that is yet upon us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Look forward to meeting with you all in the new year.